In today's video, we're going to be going over the laws of charges, conductors, and insulators. So in this part two video, what are we going to learn about? So we're first going to learn about producing charges. Second, we're going to learn about the laws of electric charges. Third, we're going to cover over the ground state of an atom. Fourth, we're going to go over positive and negative ions. And finally, fifth, we're going to go over conductors and insulators. So first of all, let's go over producing charges. So Benjamin Franklin was the first to use the words positive and negative to describe charges. So this is the picture of him. And two charges of the same type are called like charges. And that's something that he said. So Benjamin Franklin also gave the law of charges that we're going to cover over in the next slide. So now let's cover over the laws of charges that Benjamin Franklin talked about. So first of all, unlike charges attract. So here's just uh, the unlike charges. So if we have a positive and negative, they attract. And then second, like charges repel. So if we had a positive plus positive, then those two would repel. Or if we had a negative plus a negative, then those two would repel. So third, we have charged objects attract uncharged objects, or otherwise known as neutral objects. So these are the three laws of charges. So the first one just states that unlike charges attract. Second one states that the like charges repel. And the third one just says that charged objects attract uh, uncharged objects. And a good way to remember this is by magnets. So if you put two like charges magnets together, then they're going to repel. If you have two unlike charges for the magnets, so if you have the north and the south, then those two are going to attract. And for this one, this is not for that, but the magnets is a good example for it to remember the laws of charges. So now we're going to go over the ground state of an atom. So we're going to take the example of argon. So for each positive proton, there's going to be one electron. And this gives the atom a net charge and this gives the atom a net electric charge of zero. So for this example, we're going to be looking at argon. So argon is the element number 18. And if you didn't know, so the atomic number also represents how many protons and how many electrons are inside of the atom for the specific element. So in this case, argon has the atomic number of 18. So that means it's going to have 18 electrons and also 18 protons. So in the middle, there's going to be 18 protons. And in the rings, there's going to be 18 electrons. So that's why each positive proton will have one electron since the atomic number represents that. And since there's an equal number of protons plus uh, electrons, that's why it has a, a net electric charge of zero. So now let's talk about positively charged. So when the atom has fewer electrons than protons, then it becomes positively charged. So when sodium loses one electron, it becomes positively charged. So in this case, we're gonna look at the example of sodium. So what happens here is that we know that we already know that this sodium is going to be positively charged. So what happens is that what happens? So first of all, let's look at the configuration of it. So sodium, the atomic number is 11. So there's going to be 11 electrons and there's going to be 11 protons. So what happens is that since sodium has one valence electron, it's always trying to lose it. And as soon as it gives its valence electron another element, it's going to have more protons in the middle than how many electrons it has. And since it has more protons, that means it's positively charged because there's just more protons. And then we call this the Na ion, or otherwise known as sodium ion. So now let's cover over negatively charged. So in this case, we're going to be using the example of fluorine. So when the atom has more electrons than protons, then it becomes negatively charged. And when fluorine gains one electron, then it becomes negatively charged. So in this case, what happens is that, let's first look at the configuration. So fluorine, its atomic number is equal to 9. So that means it has 9 protons in the middle and 9 electrons around it. So what happens is that, as we can see, the fluorine's uh, valence electron is almost going to be full. So it just needs one more to become fully full. So in order to, so what happens is that it, it gains one electron. And as soon as it gains one electron, it has more electrons than how many protons it has. So that means it's going to have 10 electrons and 9 protons. And since it has one more electron than how many uh, protons there is, then that becomes negatively charged. And then we call this the F ion or the fluorine ion. So now we're going to cover over conductors and insulators. So materials with high electron mobility are called conductors. And this is an example of a conducting wire. And materials with low electron mobility are called insulators. 
So we can see that the insulators are in the outside, this part, and then the conductors are in the inside. So this part is the conductor, and this part would be the insulator. So furthermore, in conductors and insulators, so insulators do not allow charges to move freely on or through them. That means that the charges stay on the spot wherever you rub the object. So for example, this balloon, so this a balloon is a perfect example of an insulator. So as soon as you rub your head or something onto the balloon, the charges will just stay on there. They're not going to move anywhere, they're just going to stay there. So that's just an example of insulators. So furthermore, in conductors and insulators, so good conductors, some examples are copper, aluminum, gold, platinum, nickel, and silver. So here's some pictures. So this is a gold. This is the copper, the electron configuration for copper. And then here's some more copper wires. So those are all just good conductors. Uh, these are some good insulators. So some good insulators are paper, plastic, rubber, and water that is pure. And a good insulator has more than four valence electrons. So here's just some examples of some insulators. So there's a rubber duct here, the argon, and also a plastic bag. So when we look here at the bottom, it says that a good insulator has more than four valence electrons. So if you have any insulator that has more than four valence electrons, then that is considered as a good insulator. And anything less than four valence electrons could be considered as a good conductor. So the lower you go, so let's say that you have one uh, valence electron, such as copper, then you're going to be a really good insulator. I mean, you're going to be a really good conductor. And if you had like two valence electrons, then you're going to be a pretty good conductor still. So that's how it works. And the higher you go, the better of an insulator you become. And that's basically it for this video. So thank you so much for watching from Try to Be School, and we'll see you guys in our part three video.